Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. The last few videos have been showing the design and thought process while developing our game. This week we are going to be starting a mini-series that is a little different from our normal devlogs. In this series we are going to do a deeper dive into how we program the systems in our game. Following along should get you a great start in developing your dream game. Let's get to it. video, we are going to be covering how to set up a character controller, set up Unity's new input system, and create an extendable player state manager to control when and where your player changes states. When we are done, we will have a character controller that rotates the player in the direction of travel, responds to gravity, and can maneuver the game field. Let's go ahead and create a new project. I'm going to be using a 3D core template, but any of the 3D templates will work. I am going to be setting up a demo scene here with a couple of simple colliders for our player to traverse. Before we get started, it is important to note we are going to be using Unity's character controller component rather than the rigid body component. There are several differences, but the main one is the handling of physics. The rigid body is going to handle physics in a realistic way with friction, gravity, and forces. The character controller we are going to set up requires us to handle movement, including gravity, and will give us more control on the way we want physics to be handled. Next, I am going to the asset store and importing the Gridbox materials package. This lets us add materials to our objects without having to create any ourselves and is an invaluable asset while prototyping and developing. Go ahead and drag and drop the materials onto our objects that we just created. Next up, we need to create a playable character. Eventually, we will cover our setup for our character model and animator, but for now let's go ahead and create a 3D capsule. We need a way of knowing which direction our player is facing, so I added a 3D cube as a child object that will rotate as the parent transform is rotated. With this out of the way, let's jump into the code. If you haven't already, create a scripts folder, and within we will create a player folder. Go ahead and create a new c script named player variables. This class will be a partial class of player state manager. You can keep your player state manager all in one file, but I like to split my large classes into more manageable files. We don't need to derive from mono behavior here, so go ahead and remove it along with the start and update methods. Add a vector3 variable named moveVector. This will be the vector that sets the player's movement each frame. As we capture controller input, we will update this vector accordingly. This means we also need a vector2 variable that corresponds to the x and y axis on a joystick. We will name this one input vector. Next. Let's add a few float variables that will determine our player's walk speed and rotation speed. I will go in depth about the rotation speed variable a little bit later in this video. In addition, let's add a private vector3 variable named gravity vector. We will go more in depth on this variable also later in this video. We are going to be using Unity's new input system. This is found in the Unity Engine dot input system namespace. You'll notice we are getting a reference error. This is because we will need to install the input system through the package manager. Let's open that up and install. We will have to restart the Unity editor so those changes can be brought in properly. Go ahead and click yes. Now that we have access to the input system, we are going to add a player input variable named input. This will be tied to the player input component we will add to the player shortly. We will also need to add a character controller variable named controller. This again will be tied to the component added to the player in the inspector. Let's jump back to the editor and create another c -sharp script, which we will name player state manager. This will be part of the partial class that we started in the player variables file. In here, we will also need a reference to the Unity input system so let's add that in. We will need both the start and update methods later, so we can leave those alone for now. Let's add an awake method that Unity automatically calls when the script is being loaded. Here, we will get the character controller and input components from the player and set their respective variables. We could set the player speed and player rotate speed values in the inspector, but I much prefer to set values in the code. I'm setting the player speed to 10 a value that I found to work for this demo. For the player rotate speed, I'm going to be setting it to 180, and we will still talk about what this value means later. 
Let's set the gravity vector to a new vector 3 with values 0, negative 9.81, and 0. This will make a lot of sense when we start applying gravity to the player. Okay, we can switch back to the editor so we can add a few things to the player. Go ahead and add the player state manager script that we just got done editing. Don't forget, we also need to add the input component and character controller component so our script can find them. Next, we need to create an input action asset. Right click and go all the way down until you see input actions. Create and rename it as character input. Let's go ahead and talk about the input asset menu for just a bit. Create a new action map named character. We will be renaming the default action to movement. After this, go ahead and change the action type to value and the control type to vector2. This is going to match up with our input vector of type vector2 that we added earlier. Let's delete the empty binding and add an up down left right composite. This will be for the keyboard arrow keys. You can click on each cardinal direction, click the binding path, and listen for keyboard input. We will bind each value in this composite with the corresponding key. Go ahead and add another binding. We can listen for joystick input on a connected controller in the same way. You might want to add a stick dead zone processor to this binding. Click Save Asset and close the Asset Input window. Check the Generate C Sharp Class field and we will want to click the Apply button. You'll notice that a C Sharp class file gets generated. Great! On the Player Input component, we want to select the asset action that we just created. After selecting character input, we can see the different action maps that we have under this asset in the default map dropdown. Since we only created the one, go ahead and select character map. We can add multiple action maps and swap them in and out at runtime. In this demo, we are just going to use the one. Let's create a new C Sharp script and name it character map. Here is where we will add methods for each of our actions that we have created. In the future, whenever we add a new action to a map, we need to create the corresponding method. We will be using the input system in this class, so we need to add the reference. Rename this to be a partial class of Player State Manager. You can see why we split this class up, as there are several chunks that are nice to keep separate. We won't need the start or update here, as we are only implementing action methods in this file that belong to the character map. Create a new private void method called onMovement. We name this movement on movement as the player input component will send a message to each matched method prefixed with on in every mono behavior on the attached game object. For example, if we had these actions, we would create an on foo and an on bar method that gets called when their respective bindings get triggered. These methods take an input value parameter that I name value. It is an object, so let's go ahead and try to get a vector2 value out of it. We set up our bindings to send us a vector2, so we should be safe. Next, we want to translate the x and y coordinates of our input vector into our movement vector. We will set the x and z values of our move vector to the corresponding values from the input vector. This might be confusing, but we do this as our movement vector is a vector3, which has an xz plane that is parallel to the ground, and a y plane that is perpendicular. Let's go ahead and log out these values to make sure everything is connected and running correctly so far. Back in the editor, if we push play and wiggle our joystick or press a few arrow keys, we can see the values being locked out. If not, you might have missed something small and need to double check you have things set up correctly. We can comment these out now that we know input is working. Open up the player state manager file as we are going to implement a few methods regarding player movement. I personally like to use regions to keep my code organized. Feel free to do the same. In this region, we will create a public void method named move. Here, we will call the move method on the character controller attached to the player. This function allows us to move the connected game object in a vector direction with a supplied speed. Add in the player speed times the move vector times time dot delta time. We will create another public void method named apply gravity. Here we will call move once again. However this time we will supply the gravity vector we created a while ago. If you remember that vector was 0 for the x value, negative 9.81 for the y value, and 0 for the z value. 
So when we apply gravity, we are applying a move motion to our player downwards on the Y axis unless they hit a collider. Perfect. We will need to call the apply gravity and the move methods in our update method. Each frame we will apply gravity and update our player movement if our input vector has had any input. Jumping back to Unity and pressing play, we can see that things are working. We still need to set up player rotation, however. Let's go back to our player state manager file and add another public method, rotate towards vector. In here, let's create a xz direction variable and set it to a new vector3 with the move vector dot x and move vector dot z values in their respective spots. We are creating a vector in the direction we are moving. Next, we add a check to see if the magnitude of the vector is equal to zero. If so, it means we aren't currently moving and we won't rotate towards any new point. Next, we create a rotation variable and set it equal to quaternion dot look rotation with xz direction passed in. Quaternions help create rotations we can apply to vectors. Finish by passing in the xz direction. We need to set our player's transform rotation to quaternion dot rotate towards. This lets us pass a from rotation, a to rotation, and a degree step. This is where player rotate speed comes into play. We set it to 180, so each call to rotate towards vector will apply up to 180 degrees rotation to our player. This makes our controller feel snappy and responsive. Pass in our current rotation, the new target rotation, and the player rotate speed. We also need to make sure that we call rotate towards vector in the update method. Pressing play in Unity shows that our rotation on our player is working correctly. Trying out both the joystick and the keyboard shows slight differences in how the input vector is set. Before we move on to the second part of this video, I want to ask everyone in the comments if this type of series will be useful going forwards. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe as we love hearing feedback from the community. And if you haven't yet, also make sure to check out our other videos. In the second half of this video, we are going to be implementing a state machine for our player. This means at any given point, the player is in one state and has rules on how it can transition to neighboring states. Let's start by creating a new folder named states. In this folder, we will create four new C# scripts, one named player base state, one named walk state, another idle state, and the last fall state. Once we open up the player base state, start by removing all the using statements and the derivation to mono behavior. Let's change this class to an abstract class, the class in which all of our other states will derive. We won't use the start or update methods, so go ahead and remove those as well. We will create three virtual void methods that take in a player state manager object. One will be named enter state, another exit state, and finally update state. I did notice while recording I accidentally said virtual methods. Uh, these will be in fact abstract methods. We will have to implement each of these methods in the three state classes we created. I copy and paste these into each, change the derivation to player base state, and override each of these methods. The enter state method will be called at the start of when we switch from one state to another, basically when we first enter a new state. I am locking out a simple message that lets us know we have entered. I will also log out when we exit the state. This fires right before we switch to the next state. Since this is fairly boilerplate-y, that's a word, right? I will let you all copy and paste what we did for the other two classes. Once we are done with that, we'll jump back to the player state manager and add a new region that I named concrete states. Here, create a new public walk state, aptly named walking state. Since we implemented each method from the abstract parent, we can instantiate each as an object. Who said concrete wasn't cool? We need to create a concrete object for each of our states, and as we add new ones, we will have to keep creating. At some point in the future, we will talk about a concrete state factory. For now, this will do. Create a public player base state named current state. 
this object will be set to whichever state we are currently in. Let's go ahead and switch to the player state manager. We will need to change the start and update methods. We will set our current state at the start of runtime to be the idle state. We will also call the current state .enter state method and pass in this as we currently are the object that we want to pass. In the update method, we no longer want to handle the move functionality, as why would we call move if we are in the idle state? We will instead pass the update over to each state to handle as they choose. You can see why this methodology is so great. We aren't adding hundreds of if statements in the update method to check each frame. We will, however, leave apply gravity in this function, as we want gravity to be applied regardless of state. We need some way to switch states from within each state, as they should handle when and who they transition to. Go ahead and create a new method called switch state that takes in a player base state. First, we need to call exit state on the current state we are in. Next, we can set the current state to the new state. And finally, we can call enter state. Remember, we don't need to call update state here, as it will be called every frame and our state will be updated. Generally, it is a good idea to sketch or plan out how your state machine will look and function. Here, I have the states in which our player can be in and how each state can transition from one to another. Let's implement the idle state first, since that is the state we start in. If we look at the state machine graph, we can see that we will move from the idle state to the walk state if the move vector magnitude is greater than zero. Great, let's tackle that. In the idle state class, let's add to the update state. If the player dot move vector dot magnitude does not equal zero, then we should switch state to the walking state. And that's it. We will work on the walk state next. If we check the graph, we can see we only have one transition once again the walk state to the idle state. This is just the opposite of the last transition. Makes sense. Open up the walk state and let's make changes to the update state method. If player.moveVector.magnitude equals zero, then we should switch state to the idle state. If not, we should call the move method that we removed from the main update loop to ensure that we still move. Finally, we need to implement the false state. Remember, we will be implementing the any state to false state in the main update method. In the false state, we need to transition to the idle state if we are grounded. The character controller component has a boolean, is grounded. We can access this off the player object, and when true, we know our player has collided with an object with the ground tag. If this step doesn't work, make sure to tag your ground planes. If we are grounded, we switch to the idle state. If not, go ahead and move. I added this part as I like the player having mobility in the air. Let's finally implement the any state. We can see that at any point if we are not grounded, we need to transition to the false state if we aren't currently in the false state. Open up the player state manager once again. If the current state is not equal to the falling state and we are not grounded, we need to switch state to the falling state. And there's one last thing that we need to do in the move function, we need to call the rotate towards vector. That way anything that calls to move will also update the rotation. Let's push play once more, and if things were set up correctly, you should have a character controller that has working states, uses the new input system, and should be easily extendable. Thank you all so much for watching. With this series being a little heavier than our devlog series, we are thinking we will alternate these every third week or so. I hope to hear some comments on what you guys would like to see next. We will see you next time.